Welcome to A Course in Miracles, text chapter eight. Uh, we'll, get, we'll kick off immediately with the journey back, um, 8.1, the direction of the curriculum. So it hasn't explained the direction of the curriculum in chapter one, two, or seven, um, but at the beginning of, of the book, um, at the introduction stage, it gives you a very clear direction that the world is an outer condition of an inner experience. What this does now is it gives you the understanding of the mechanism of miracles. The, the how does the miracle actually work and where is the miracle taking place, which of course we now understand it's taking place in the mind and only the mind. It doesn't happen anywhere else because nothing else but mind exists. And the entire dream is taking place in the dreamer's mind. Again, it's addressing us not as the body-mind identity, but as the spirit, as the self, capital S self, self, which is the decision maker. And it's asking us to give authority of our mind, of our awareness to the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit, which is the memory for God, remember, the Holy Spirit's not a being. That's where Christianity gets it wrong because I couldn't understand Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So the Son was a body, so the Holy Spirit must be a being and God must be a being. And if God is a being and it's the only being that exists, then God's being is everything. And the whole universe, which exists in the mind of that beingness, the Son's mind, is an illusion. It's a dream state. Although the dream appears real to the dreamer who has localized himself in 8 billion ways on this planet at the moment. It's asking you to go into the dreamer's awareness. So you step out of this body-mind identification into the silent self where the awareness of being aware becomes known to thyself, be thyself knowingly. And it says, choose again. So you either focus on the problems of the world, trying to find solutions. And as soon as you figure a solution, another problem arises. Or you realize none of this is real and you don't pay any attention. You don't give those thoughts any attention. Your thoughts immediately get directed to God. Okay. Or symbolically, if you'd like, Christ. But at some stage, you'll realize that Christ is your highest mind. And that which was Jesus symbolically, Jesus is a symbol of how to act. Jesus is a symbol of what you are, a holy son of God. So Jesus is a symbol of a fracture of the mind, a, a localization of the mind, just as you are localization, a localization that figured out what it is. It realized it is the dreamer. And as it awoke and demonstrated that it's a dream through resurrection and ascension, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, is showing you that you don't have to go through the same process of crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, but just be as you are, follow me and come innocently, follow, follow in the footsteps means behave like he did. Don't worship him. He's very clear about that in chapter three and chapter four. Don't worship Jesus. Don't revere him. Reverence is left for God, but honor him as a brother because you and I are one. As the father is in me, so I'm in the father. And as the father is in, in, in me, so the father is in you, as I am in you. So Jesus is saying that the, the, the representation the signpost, Jesus is saying, you and I are one. Be as you are. Be like me. Because you are me. When you're awake, you are me. When you're awake, when we're all awake, we're the dreamer. The dream ends. The dreamer realizes he's never left the kingdom. So he's addressing you as a decision maker. And he's saying, choose again. Give, give the authority of your thoughts, all your thoughts, activities to the Holy Spirit. And so when you're in wrong-mindedness, it's always going to be forgive and be free. Forgive and be willing to be shown another way. That's the way of the Christ. That's what Jesus taught while he was embodied. And so follow in his footsteps. People like to say Jesus is our savior. Jesus isn't saving you. His activities, if you follow them, save you. His understanding, if you listen, saves you. The acceptance of your divinity as God's holy son is what saves you. Not worshiping or believing in a Jesus. Now you believe in Jesus, you're saved. Now you believe the works of Jesus, the fruits of the tree, 
and you bear the same fruits, that is your saving. So who's actually saving? It's the call from God, God's Holy Spirit. The memory of God sa saves what? Awakes us. Saving is awakening. Enlightenment, awakening. Awakening to self, the realization I am. That I am. I am that which is dreaming. I am. Okay, so the direction of the curriculum is very clear. In the very first line, it is, I'm going to highlight it in purple because it's just so powerful. And it is, knowledge is not the motivation for learning this course. Now, the path of knowledge is definitely a path to awakening. Devotion is the other one. Service is the next one. Karma is the last one. This course is a path of undoing our thinking process. This isn't a path of... Um, constant prayer. This is a part of realigning through understanding and understanding comes through knowledge and true knowing comes in encompassing understanding in our own experience. So knowledge is not the motivation for learning this course, peace is. And peace is the condition for true transcendence of our identity from body-mind identity separation to spirit self-identity, spirit self-Christ identity. And what this course wants to do is put you in a position where through inner awareness, contemplation, stillness, the transcendence comes into the full knowing of yourself as that which is the Holy Son of God. This, pre, this, this is the prerequisite for knowledge only because those who are in conflict are not peaceful. Think about it. If you're not peaceful, how can you absorb anything? Think about when you're panicking or you're under stress. There's no peace. And when there's no peace, you're not taking anything in. Okay. And so peace is the condition of knowledge because it is the condition of the kingdom. And as we've read before in previous chapters, you are the kingdom in which God resides. We call it symbolically our heart. But since the only thing that is true is the heart, the kingdom, the self, you being the self, you being the kingdom, in order to know the kingdom, know thyself, be thyself, knowingly, you have to be in a condition called peace. Okay. Knowledge can be restored only when you meet its conditions. And, and that's such a powerful line. So knowledge, the true knowing, not belief, not faith, not hope, the knowing, knowledge, the true knowing of what you are and what God is. And this is vital, this next line. It says here, this is not a bargain made by God. God is not saying, okay, this is you have to be peaceful before you can know me because God makes no bargain. It is merely the result of your misuse of his laws. Remember, there's, there's, this is badly capitalized in this old text. So bear with me with the capitalization. And I'm not going to keep repeating it. So when you see his laws, please don't be offended because this is, this is an old PDF taken off an old, old text, you know, written back in the 70s. So who makes no bargains. It's merely the result of your misuse of his laws be, on, behalf, on behalf of an imaginary will that is not God's will, that is not his. Knowledge is his will. Why? Because when he created us, he created us from the same essence as himself, and therefore every essence, like every droplet that comes out of the ocean has the exact DNA of the ocean, every son of God has the exact same essence and therefore knowing as the collective God. And so knowledge is the knowing of yourself as that which is the sonship, which is the kingdom, which exists as the extension of God's love. If you are opposing his will, how can you have knowledge? Because you're contradicting yourself and uh, you're, you're refusing to accept it. I have told you that knowledge of what knowledge offers you, but perhaps you do not yet regard this as wholly desirable. And again, it comes back to that teaching of Jesus. I seek mercy, not sacrifice. We believe that by truly going completely into the devotion of God, into the knowing of God, we're going to have to give up the world. And the minute you try and give up the world, you've made it real, and now you're trying to give up something you've made real. There's nothing to give up. 
it's realizing everything is what it is. And you look at it for its pure practical purpose. You're no longer looking for the pleasure of things. There may be expressions of your joy, but you don't need them anymore. You love all of it because you realize all of it is in you. And if you did, you would not be so ready to throw it away when the ego asks you for its allegiance. So we're afraid because we don't design the knowing of ourself and knowing God above all else. Seek ye first the kingdom above all else and all else shall be given you. So the ego then will distract you. That's it's designed now because it doesn't want you to know yourself because the knowing of yourself means the dispelling, the dissolving of the ego identity. The distractions of the ego may seem to interfere with your learning, but the ego has no power to distract you unless you give it the power to do so. So it means, oh, I don't have time for this. and you know, Oh, I can't make time to do the course. Put yourself in the habit. If you really want to do this, the first thing you should do in the morning, open your eyes, start in gratitude, do your toilet duties, go to your breakfast area where you sit and have breakfast, open the course, have a coffee, have a holy cigarette, be still, acknowledge Christ's presence with you, in you, as you all the time. Open the course, 10 minutes a day, just 10 minutes a day, one section. And when you get into the habit and becomes part of your makeup, you'll look forward to that morning. I do. And it's just my most, it's my most precious time, if I can put it that way. The ego's voice is an hallucination. What a beautiful way to describe the ego's voice. It's hallucination. You're hallucinating. You're dreaming. You cannot expect it to say, I'm not real, because you've made it real for you. Yet you are not asked to dispel your hallucinations alone. You're not, you don't have to do this alone. It's just your willingness will induce Holy Spirit, which will do it for you, because you've made this riddle. You've made the trap. Holy Spirit will be the way out of the trap, the memory of God. So Hansel and Gretel, the little breadcrumbs. The Holy Spirit course miracles is like little breadcrumbs that when you find yourself lost in this maze of darkness, you just look back and you follow the breadcrumbs, the memory to the light. You are merely asked to evaluate them in terms of their results to you. So you don't have to get rid of the hallucinations. You just have to ask yourself, are these thoughts I'm having, these ideas I'm having, this world, is it serving me and being happy? And in order for me to be happy, I need to be peaceful. And then has it given me a deep understanding of what I am? Because everybody that is no longer trapped in the illusions of, of acquiring in this world starts looking, when they've turned inwards, the inward path, seek to know thyself. You know, unless you go within, you go without. And unless you've turned in, the minute you've turned in, you start inquiring, who am I? What am I? What is God? What is this? What are angels? Are they real? Is there a spirit world? What happens when I die? How do I know? How can I prove it? Is there something called death? You know? And so this book, this path, which is the teachings of the Christ mind, of course, spoken as if it comes from the word Jesus because he's symbolic for us and we can relate to it, um, asks you to evaluate everything in terms of does it provide you with peace? If not, don't do it. If you do not want them on the basis of the loss of peace, they will be removed from your mind for you. Don't you worry about how it happens. It just won't pop up anymore. Every response to the ego is a call for war, a call for conflict, in other words. And whether it's conflict internally or conflict with others, which is no, difference to the, no different to the conflict internally. And war does deprive you of peace, of course. And this is the condition for knowing, for knowledge. Yet in this war, there is no opponent because you are your own enemy. This is the reinterpretation of reality that you must make to secure peace. You read that line again. This is the reinterpretation. This is what the Course is doing. It's reinterpreting everything our ego mind has made now it's given to Holy Spirit and he reinterprets it for us and says, look, everything's an echo for the voice of God. Turn inwards and know thyself. Okay. So this is a reinterpretation of the reality that you must make to secure peace. And the only one you need, and I'd go so far as to say must, ever make 
It's the, the willingness to have this reinterpreted for you. Those whom you perceive as opponents are part of your peace. Let's think about this. Let's stop for a second. So think of the people that you've held grievance against. Think of all those people that have cheated, hurt, lied, stolen from you, abused you verbally, whatever. Bosses, spouses, friends, lovers, mothers, fathers, people that have hurt you, bruised you, hurt your hurt you. Now the ego's hurt, heart, we call it the heart, but it's actually the ego's hurt. Okay. They are, they are your, they are not your opponents. They're a part of your peace. Wow, how can they be? Okay. Which you are giving up by attacking them. So when you give up attacking them, the consequence is peace. How can you have what you give up? Okay. You're giving up the knowledge of what you are. But how can you have it if you've given up? By realizing you haven't given it up. You've just forgotten. You share to have, but you do not give it up yourself. When you give up peace, you're excluding yourself from it because you are the condition of the kingdom. And the kingdom is peace. This is a condition so alien to the kingdom that you cannot understand the state that prevails within it. So when you really know yourself and know yourself as your heart, the kingdom of God, in which God abides and resides, because that's you and you actually abide there and the rest of you is not real. It's just a projection, a misrepresented projection. Then you'll know that peace, that perpetual peace, that everlasting peace. Your past learning must have taught you wrong things simply because it hasn't made you happy. Because if the past made you happy and what you learned made you happy, you wouldn't be doing this course. You wouldn't be searching for God, happiness, enlightenment, or whatever it is that you embarked upon in order to get out of the past suffering. On this basis alone, value should be questioned. If learning aims at change, and of course it always does, and that is always its purpose, are you satisfied with the, with the changes your learning has brought you? Because you changed, you being you grew, you made more money, you had a career, you climbed the ladder, you changed all the time. Are you happy with those changes? Did it bring you peace? Or did it just bring you to the next snake and ladder point in the game, which didn't bring you true peace? Well, then let's look at it another way. Then, then there must be another way because the old way didn't work. The, work of, the way of ambition, power, chasing, acquiring, proving yourself, finding self-worth, improving your self idea image that didn't work didn't bring you peace it was happy while you were pursuing it while you were doing it why because there was no thinking happening it focused you were completely focused there was no time for the ego to interrupt even though the ego was acting out okay so this is the satisfaction with learning outcomes is a sign of learning failure which means the ego has failed to teach us or we failed to learn from it which means that you did not get what you wanted. And if we did, we wouldn't be doing this course. The curriculum of the atonement is opposite of the curriculum you have established for yourself, but so is its outcome. And this yourself is the ego, is your identification. If the outcome of yours has made you unhappy, and if you want a different one, a change in the curriculum is obviously necessary. But I'm Course in Miracles. The first change is to be introduced is a change in direction. So as opposed to looking outwards and apportioning blame or looking outwards and believing you're the victim, it's turning inwards and realizing this is all happening in me because of my thoughts, ideas, beliefs, and thus projection. A meaningful curriculum cannot be inconsistent. And think of the inconsistencies of religion. It's so confusing that it has so many well, 20,000 sects of Christianity, and none of them agree with each other. 20,000 sects of Christianity. How can this be when the bringer of the light and the teaching is, is one man, Jesus, the Christ? How can his teaching, which is so pure, even if you go back to the Bible, read it from a non-dual perspective, the teachings, not the stories, the teachings, you realize, wow, he, Jesus was a non-dualist. Of course he was. If it is planned by two teachers, each believing in diametrically opposed ideas, it cannot be integrated. If it is carried out by those two teachers simultaneously, each one merely interferes with the other. They're getting in each other's way. They're getting in the, your way. And that's why people that are often confused 
and get stuck and deliberate a lot, they can't move is because <clears throat> they don't have clarity of direction. They don't have clarity of authority of their mind. And this leads to fluctuation, but not to change. And, and people today, you can see it more and more in the world with the woke generation and so forth and so forth. Everybody's looking for identity, but not only identity, the recognition of identity, and not only the recognition of identity, the little ego, uniqueness identification. Okay, so everybody wants to be identified for with what they identify with. Now, if you're identifying with an illusionary construct, okay, that you can't even comprehend yourself, now you're wanting everybody else to identify with that which you identify in your own identity. And then you expect outcomes to be the same. It's never going to happen. I understand what's, called, what's happening. Spirit's calling us and saying, but you're all identically the same in truth, in your very essence. The self, the spirit of all of us is identical. And the outcome of the self in all of us is identical. The outcome for all of us is an identical outcome. But you cannot expect humans to comply because humans are uniquely different. And then they still think they're special and uniquely programmed as a part of the picture. One, each one is a part of the puzzle. And if you make two people the same part of the same puzzle, the puzzle won't be complete. What, it's, what this world is really calling for, and we call it in all different words like autonomy, okay? And we wanna protect our bodies and say, you have no control over my body. Well, no one does except ego or Holy Spirit. Who do you give it to? And so what you see these movements shouting out today in the news, it's calling for false autonomy and false identity. And the one thing we must agree on is the quality of self and outcome. Yet if they turned inwards, they would realize that their outward demonstration against what's happening in the world, if it was actually fully understood as the self in me is the self in everyone, and it's gonna have an equal outcome, which is the awakening in God, realizing it's just a dream, we wouldn't be fighting with everything because who's fighting? Just the ego. Why? While it keeps us volatile and in conflict, it keeps us bound to the dream. The volatile have no direction. They cannot choose one because they cannot relinquish the other, even if it does not exist because they've made it real for them. Their conflicted curriculum teaches them all that all directions exist and gives them no rationale for choice. And this is what we want in today's new woke world. We want everybody to have unlimited choices, unlimited equality. But if everybody's programmed differently and everybody was given exactly the same set of paintbrushes, paint and a white piece of white paper, for as many people as are out there, you're going to have that many different pictures. Not one of them will be identical. Some may be similar, but not one will be identical. What's identical is the essence of all of us, not the illusion body-mind projection. The total senselessness of such a curriculum must fully be recognized before real change in direction becomes possible because you have to realize what's actually changing and what is direction because you're not turning anywhere. You're sinking back into yourself, into the very true self, capital S self. You cannot learn simultaneously from two teachers who are in total disagreement about everything. Their joint curriculum presents an impossible learning task. And why? Because one is super complicated. And as soon as you figure out there's more complications and the other one is dead simple, do only this, right mindedness. Do, in actual fact, do nothing. Just be still and know I am. So they are really teaching you entirely different things in entirely different ways. And you have to recognize that, okay? which might be possible, except that both are teaching you about your self. And the only time it differs is when you capitalize that word self as a separate word, meaning capital S self, okay? And that capital S self like Superman is what you are. You are the self, which is the Holy Son of God. Okay. Your reality, the truth about you is unaffected by both. But if you listen to both, your mind will be split about what your reality is. And how can your reality be unaffected by both? Well, if you're listening to the Holy Spirit, you're unaffected because you are what you are. If you're listening to the ego, regardless of what the ego thinks you are, you are still that which you are. I am that I am. I am that in which I am is known as that which is known. 
I am that in which the universe appeared. I am that in which I recognize myself. I am that which is the extension of the love of God, the extension which is God's kingdom. I am that in which God abides. I abide in God and God abides in me because there's no division, there's no separation. As the Father is in me, so the Father is in you. And then Christ reminds us as a dream character that's now dissolved into the awakened awareness of the mind, the Christ mind. He's with us always. And we don't do this on our own. Why? Because one of us, Jesus figured it out before us. And the minute he figured it out, it's in the dream as mind. And so every projection of himself, 8 billion projections of himself, the dreamer, have this new awareness infused in them by whatever name they want to call it. But the awareness called love, peace, joy is there and is calling us to return to self. And you can see it through the new woke movement. And and um because there's, there's this generation coming through and they somewhere deep inside them, they know that there's an equality of essence because they cannot touch on that essence. They, they're not in their awareness. They're looking for equality and identity. And since they can't find equality and identity, they then want to destroy the identities and make up 36 or 105. Some people now identify as a squid. Okay. And... <laughs> There's no squid, there's no body, there's no person, there's no male, there's no female. And we want to now kill the gender discussions. You're now trying to get an ego, which is hanging on to its ego identity to say there's no such thing as a man or no such thing as a woman. And what is a woman? They won't answer it. What is a man? They won't answer it. Why are you appeasing that? What you want to understand is the true I am is identical. And the outcome is identical. We all awaken as one, as the son of God and realize we've never left. The body-mind identity, there'll never be an, out, an equal of outcome of that. And you can never have an identification in complete clarity of that because identification is preconceived, preconceived projections of self. And so we identify as we want to. I identify as Batman. Can you see it? Of course you can because I'm Batman. And if you don't call me Lord Batman, well, then we're going to have a problem. And how can I expect you to see it that way? How can I be offended if you're not? I'm only offended because deep inside, there's a realization I am. But the minute it's not recognized through understanding and knowledge, it becomes I am dot, 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 X, Y, Z. And the minute you add to it, you've now projected outwards and you're lost. I hope that makes clear sense. Well, I'm stopping there. We'll ask some, we'll get some questions going and then we'll continue. We now move on to text chapter 8, 8.2, the journey back. And uh, we look at the section two, which is the difference between imprisonment and freedom, which sounds quite obvious, but until you really realize what is imprisoning you and what is freeing, or what freedom actually means, because you cannot, you cannot acquire freedom. You are freedom itself. It's like you can't acquire peace. You are peace itself. You cannot find love. You are love itself. So how do you know that you are love, peace, joy? You've got to get rid of the ideas, the filters that prevent you from knowing. And this is what this chapter is going to do for us. It's going to show us the difference on how we've been lied to, how we misperceived and then projected the truth. So everything we see in the universe is actually not just, it's, it's an hallucination of what's actually there. It's, we're missing it, but we're missing it because we're misprojecting it. And when we realize how our thought system works, we realize, ah, that's not mine. Thoughts aren't mine. I don't have any thoughts. And that's why there's this wonderful verse. Um, I think it's lesson 186 where it says, um, there's a line in that that says, you don't really have any thoughts. The only true thoughts you have are the thoughts you have with God, loving thoughts. So when you have no judgment and you completely accept and you accept, and you accept, uh, you accept it as a memory of God, an uh, echo for the voice of God, that's the closest you get to any real thinking. Any other thought is just the ego and the variations of the levels of the ego. Spirit has no level because it's always... In, in true reality. 
So the difference between imprisonment and freedom, there's a rationale for choice. So there's a, there's a very clear reasoning for making the right choice. Only one teacher knows what your reality is. Okay, so that clear Holy Spirit, the memory of God, the teacher, the Christ mind, knows what your reality is. Why? Because it's still in God's reality. Whereas a part of it, a part of itself, a part of the Son of God is awake, Christ. The rest of it is asleep and projecting the world of illusions. That Christ mind is in the bridge consciousness. So it's aware of its creator and is aware it hasn't left. But it's aware that a part of its mind hasn't forgotten the dream, hasn't forgiven the dream, hasn't forgiven itself, and therefore is still dreaming. The awake part wants to awaken the sleeping part. It's like you wake up in the middle of the night in your dream and you say, oh, I'm on my bed. I'm dreaming. And I can smell mom's cooking. Mom's Portuguese peri-peri chicken. Mm, I want to go have some of that. But I can't get out of bed because all those characters in my dream still take the dream seriously. And even though I'm just sitting on the street corner going, the end is near. Hallelujah. Um, we're awake. The rest are looking at me going, no, you're not. Shut up. Put him in jail. White padded cell, zip him up on the back, don't let him, don't let him speak, put a muffler on, you know, COVID-21. <laughs> and so the one teacher saying, I know the truth. I know the, what the reality is. And you're dreaming, you're dreaming of building castles. Let me show you the real kingdom, which your castle has nothing in comparison. If learning to remove the obstacles to that knowledge is the purpose of the curriculum, this is it. So if learning to remove, learning to remove the obstacles to that knowledge is the purpose of A Course in Miracle. You must learn it of him who is the teacher that knows. The ego does not know what it is. It doesn't even know. So if it doesn't know what it is, it doesn't know what it's trying to teach. And that's why 8 billion people. 8 billion identities, 8 billion ideas, 8 billion ideologies. Yes, some are clustered, and those are clustered together form groups, and they not only fight within the groups for leadership and for autonomy, they fight with other groups. Why? Because no one single ego finds any true identity in any other ego, and the closest they can get on is if they have a common enemy. Okay. So the ego is trying to teach you that you are without that you are without knowing what you are. And he doesn't have to teach you that because we don't know. We have forgotten. It is, it is expert only in confusion. It does not understand anything else but confusion and conflict. Confusion and conflict. That's all it does. So everything that ego teaches you is going to find a reason to find something wrong with the world with other people, with other beliefs, with other systems, color of skin, sex, identification, et cetera, et cetera. As a teacher there, the ego is totally confused and totally confusing. Even if you could disregard the Holy Spirit entirely, which is impossible because it's the call for love from within you. The Holy Spirit, remember, it's the memory of God in the very essence of what you are. You could still learn nothing from the ego because the ego knows nothing. And take it from someone that spent his whole life studying and degrees and doctorates and nonsense. The more I learned, the more I realized I didn't know and the more I wanted to learn. And eventually, after studying every possible religion, way, psychology, anthropology, human behavioral psychology, marketing strategy, business, blah, 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 architecture, sacred geometries. Hi, caramba. Still made no sense. And the only conclusion I could come up to was God was mad or completely sick or perverted or both. And then I said, there must be another way. And the non-dual understanding came through because I had to get to that point of giving up, thinking that through my own intellectual device, devises, means, tenacity, ambition, drive to push, to understand, to know, in order to be free, happy. I would figure it out. And it's only when I eventually just begrudgingly, but exhaustedly said, I just can't do this anymore. Just oh, fuck it. There's no answer. You know, there's just no answer. And fuck you, God. 
you know, what the fuck were you thinking? And I mean, I was feeling guilty at the same time as saying that I was swearing at God. And I never believed God is going to punish me, but I just, there's no hope. Why did you do this? And the clarity came through. I did not create this mess. You did. It was clear, such a clear voice. I did not create this mess. You did. But I'll show you a way out. If you're willing to throw away everything you think you know, truly empty your cup. Now, for someone who spent his whole life educating himself, paying for his education while working, and I would put such pride in my qualifications and degrees and, and learning. Because, yes, it was a sense of self-worth and, and inner self-worth and inner identification that to throw all of this away was like asking me to stop breathing and still live. And yet the overwhelming desire to know the essence of my source and somehow without understanding and knowing it, knowing that when I knew it, when I got to it, I would finally find that release that I've been searching for as long as I can remember as a child, been searching for that liberation. Only then was I really willing to just let it all go. And as soon as I did, there was an instant flip, a holy instant, and the course found me. And, and I mean, of course, I've been preparing for the understanding through that Vita, Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, Egyptian Book of the Dead, the, the non-dual teachings from all over the world, uh, I Ching. There'd been a preparation, the regressional work that I did as a, as a therapist, past life regression, life between us. Everything was bringing me closer, but I wouldn't. I, there's no way I was going to go past it because I was still relying on my own intellect. And what is the intellect? It's the playing out of the ego in a particular way. And when I was just let go, the answers came and the clarity. And that was, was so amazing, the clarity out. Everything I'd learned, everything I'd understood, everything I'd built, designed, focused on, just got flipped over and it became an echo. And I started to see God in everything. Sacred geometers, mutely, I Ching, Solgafredo. I started to see the essence of God, the frequency in myself and I, the recognition. The recognition was there. And, and it would never have been if I'd not surrendered because the ego knows nothing. And I'm sharing this with you, not about me, but again, I keep saying, if this character, which was so unhappy and so angry, vicious to the point of destructive, could find it, you can. Um, is, there, is there any possible reason for choosing a teacher like this, a destructive, lost in translation teacher that's changing his mind the whole time, that fights with everything all the time, that never finds satisfaction in anything, and certainly not permanently. And if there's satisfaction, it's so you know, short-lived. Does this total disregard of anything it teaches make anything but sense? Is this the teacher to whom a son of God should turn to to find himself? Well, of course not, because you won't even allow the idea of a son of God to be ascribed to you. Because if you do believe in God and a Christ or a Buddha or a Muhammad, then it's out there not to be reached, to be revered, worshipped, and praised. So you'd never even allow yourself the audacity, the blasphemy of allowing yourself to equate yourself to Christ. So no, of course, just no way. The ego has never given you a sensible answer to anything simply on the grounds of your own experience with its teaching, should this not alone disqualify it as your future teacher? As anything you've ever learned up until you started going into non-duality in any way served you in your peace? If not, how could it possibly then lead to happiness if you don't even have the foundation called peace? And yet the ego has done more harm to your learning than this alone because it's made you believe you're alone separated and lonely in your separation, different and unusual and unaccepted and therefore never worthy. Learning is joyful if it leads you along your natural path. And you've heard me say this, I talk about this 
your, your nature, in other words, your talent, what you call your passion, and your passion is your talent. You don't have to teach anyone your passion. You're naturally talented. At it. So if you play with it, if you, if you focus attention on it, you become brilliant. Good, good to great. Jim Collins. So you, you pay attention to your natural talent. You thrive. Don't try and fix your errors. Thrive on your natural. So your natural path is following your intrinsic natural nature, your passionate nature. Don't all give this up and become teachers for God. You're being a teacher for God in your natural path, your natural nature, your passionate nature. So if learning to be yourself authentically, unapologetically, truthfully, knowingly, passionately this, and yet this that knows the essence of itself is one with its source, is the self, is the Christ, is the God, is the kingdom, is love itself. Then that means that just by loving what I do, whether it be art, architecture, being a policeman, teacher, artist, doctor, surgeon, policeman, military, whatever it is, just do it passionately, being consciously present, seeing everything as a cry for love or an act of love. That's living your joy, being living your genius. Your genius is your joy and facilitates the development of what you have. When you are taught against your nature, which is what the ego does, however, you will lose by your learning because your learning will imprison you. So what is the imprisonment that this title of this chapter speaks about? The imprisonment is the belief system that prevents you from knowing yourself, being yourself knowingly, passionately, authentically, unapologetically yourself. He has this line. You've heard me say this before many a time in many of my posts. Your will is God's will. Your will is in your nature. Don't try and be anything else. Like I say, David Hofmeister, beautiful, gentle, tender, joyful teacher, brings that you can hear the joy in his teaching. He's a beautiful being, beautiful Christ mind in this world as we speak here now. But David tried to be Lou, he'd fail. And Lou tried to be David, definitely failed, got too much hair. <laughs> Sorry, David. <laughs> We're nature differently, yet the essence in David and the essence in Lou and the essence in you is identical, the I am. The character and how it plays out and the very inanimate character, Lou, and the very gentle, joyous, playful David, that matters not. The truth that flows through us from our being to your being, which is the shared being of God in us, the Christ. The shared being, we share with Jesus, we share with God. That's the important thing. And then your will is your nature. And when you serve God by serving your brothers, loving your creations, but in your knowing, not in your lost in translation ego self, your will is in your nature. And therefore you cannot, don't try, go against it. The ego cannot teach you anything as long as your will is free. And your will is free because it was made that way. Because you will not listen to it because we all cry for freedom and we all have an authority problem. And so when the ego tries to force you into being authoritative, you're going to deny it. And then it tries to catch you through the back door by being submissive and getting you to become submissive. It is not your will to be imprisoned because your will is free. You are freedom itself. That is why the ego is the denial of free will. And why? how does it become the denial? But the minute you've identified with body, mind, role play, and the, 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 the myriad of roles, father, husband, brother, CEO, blah, 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 blah. I don't know if you've seen, I put a post up, can you be a CEO and be enlightened? My answer is no. There is no such thing as a CEO, can you be a CEO? See, there's a role you play. No different to, can I be a full-time teacher for God? You can be a teacher for God and be lost. You can be a CEO and be awake. There is no such thing as CEO and there's no such thing as enlightenment because it's such a heavy weighed light word <laughs> because enlightenment has this expectation. What is true enlightenment? Atonement, the recognition of our shared being, 
of our essential nature, which is our shared being, and therefore the same nature as God. Our true essence, our true nature is pure love, played out peace, joy, and then filtered through this body-mind identification. Now, I surrender to Holy Spirit, your passionate nature. You want to serve God, serve your brothers in their awakening, not in what you do, but how you do it and why you do it. So let's start with the why. Because by sharing it, I know I have it. How? By being authentic in my understanding and seeing my brothers. Now the what's irrelevant? Artist, policeman, teacher for God, CEO. What does those roles mean? Nothing. The minute you ascribe and hang on to the role, you're lost. This is what you do. You're a husband. You're a mother. You're a father. You've got children. You've got a, you, it doesn't matter. You don't give those things. You don't give up your children. You don't, you don't have, to, have to give up anything, not your car, not your house. You don't have to give up your job. There are some people that are going to be full-time teachers of God, David, okay, and some of his mighty companions, full-time teachers. This is not designed that way. My nature is to go into corporates, big clients, 300,000 staff, deep trouble, 300,000 jobs to be lost, turn it around. Do I lose awareness of what I am? How can I? I am the awareness and I'm going there because of the awareness which shows my passionate true nature in my divine DNA, which is the essence of God, is calling me to go there and serve through the tools I have, not identified, whether you call me managing director or brother at the office, it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I always ask people to call me by my first name. And since they can't say Louis in South Africa, it becomes Lou. And after a while, Lou becomes Luigi because it's a for clanging in Afrikaans. Um, it's a term of endearment. So it's not a spiritual name. Luigi is not a spiritual name. It's a it, it, Luigi or Luigi is what people call me in South Africa. Nothing spiritual about this hasn't been given to me by some mystical guru who walks on water. Okay, so it is never God who coerces you. It's only your ego because he shares his will with you. Capital H is there, guys. Okay, his voice teaches only. And remember, his voice is not an audible thing. It's an inner silent voice that is clearly directive in its awakened awareness of self. Okay. His voice teaches only in accordance with his will, capital H, capital W, God's will always in capital. But that is not the Holy Spirit's lesson because that is what you are. So he's not trying to teach you. He's just trying to remind you to recognize your essential nature as God's essential nature. The lesson is that your will and God's cannot be out of accord because they are one. Okay. So your will and God's will are the same and your nature and God's nature are the same because they're one. You're made from God's will and his essence. This is the undoing of everything an ego tries to teach. So know this much. If you were to die right now in the recognition that your true self is still one of God in the Christ mind, there's no more need for incarnation. Back to spirit world, floaty, floaty spirit, listen to violin music played by the angels and then incarnate another body breast milk for nine months, school from another 20 years, indoctrination, nonsense. No need. Transcend. No more body-mind. Join the Christ mind, and it gets your conscious awareness just lights up the Christ mind as it's lit by the Christ mind. And more of the collective mind, dreaming mind, awakens to the reality of what itself is. It is not then the only direction of the curriculum that must be unconflicted but also the content. And that's why the course says you either believe all of this, or not at all. And there are some students that want to say, yes, but you know, God created the universe. Um, the sonship of God are the millions of beings there, not one son dreaming it up. No, you either completely understand the non-duality of this, or you will not get this course. There's no conflict to this course because there's no conflict in the course. Non-duality us in God made from the same essence as that which created us. And therefore our truest nature, the, the essence of what we are, our shared being, shared with God, shared with each other, the brotherhood of the Christ awakens in God as one. Not we all awaken in God as separate body minds. There are no separate of us to return. One son returns, one God. Okay. The ego tries to teach you 
that you want to oppose God's will. Now, generally, we wouldn't want to oppose God's will, but the very fact that we're in flesh means we have. The fact that we live in a universe and appear to die means that we have, and we still do. This unnatural lesson cannot be learned, and the attempt to learn it is a violation of your own freedom, making you afraid of your will because it is free. And we're afraid of our will. We're afraid of our power because we think that when we exercise our will and our power, we'll have to give something up. And you need give up nothing. And take us from an example for someone who whole life pursued people, places, things, events, got all the stuff, found out, happy, was completely unhappy, and then turned in what's found. My, in the beginning of my awake, I started giving things away. And then I realized I'd given my fridge away and my couch away. Where do I sit now? <laughs> I had to get another couch, another fridge. Now, some people are designed to just go out and teach full time. I wasn't designed that way. My calling was calling me into the darkest, dark corporate world. And so you don't need to give up anything. As I say, as I've, as I've become more peaceful, so I've had, I have no need for things for pleasure, motorcycle. I say, yes, I still ride. But now I ride only when I'm feeling joyous and peaceful. I don't ride to become joyous and peaceful. Is, you know, yeah, there's a lot of motorcycle stories. Oh, motorcycling is freedom, the wind in the face and the air, long road. Yeah, until you run out of petrol. Yeah, until some truck tries to run you over. Yeah, until it starts raining. Yeah, until you meet sons of a Nazi, you know, in the free state. And uh, <laughs> it's not free in the free state. It's just flat. Orange free state called, and hence, sons of a Nazi. Okay. Um, there's nothing freeing in this world other than the knowing of the soul. And, and the more you pursue it, the more you, you realize it's not, it's not to be found outside. You. Go within or go without. The Holy Spirit opposes any imprisoning of the world of the Son of God, knowing that the will of the Son is the will of the Father. The Holy Spirit leads you steadily, gently, gently, because else you're going to go kicking and screaming. And kicking and screaming only happens to a few people, like uh, Ramana Maharashi. You know, there's a, a sudden jerk calling you, you know. Um, the Holy Spirit leads you steadily along the path to freedom, teaching you how to disregard the, or look beyond everything else that would hold you back. So it shows you where to look and shows you how to look. And I, I, don't, I say, how does he show you? It just built in. All of a sudden, you'd be looking at things differently. You go, where did that come from? How come I'm, how come I'm not judging you? Oh, it's because I told the Holy Spirit, lead the way. Okay. I started, once a kind of time, I used to get so angry in traffic. Now, oh, meditation time. Put on a course of miracles, listen to whatever, you know, and sing along. And just the joy starts to flow. Oh, when did traffic become fun? when you were willing to be, to be shown. We have said that the Holy Spirit teaches you the difference between pain and joy. Okay? That is the same as saying he teaches you the difference between imprisonment and freedom. Because what we don't realize is the things that we think are joyous actually bind us. Think about it, you want the house, the castle, and the beach. So you go and get a bond, a loan, and it now bonds you for 20 years. So what was once upon a time your thought of joy now becomes your pain. Now payments, you worry about the debt mortgages, as you call them in the States. Holy Spirit says, well, you need a house for it. Just go once a year on holiday. Your brain says, but what an investment. Your brain says, do you need the risk? The Holy Spirit says, do you need the risk? He just starts showing you another way to look at it. You truly want to be free? You know, be like Mahatma Gandhi. He had very little. He went around sharing and, and bringing liberation to people oppressed without violence. You cannot make this distinction without him because you have taught yourself that imprisonment is freedom. So what is imprisonment? It's the clutching onto, the hanging onto, the stuff, the pleasures of this world, people, places, things, and events. It's not giving up people, places, things, and events. It's not detaching from people, places, things, and events. It's being non-attached to people, places, things, and events. Non-attached. Realizing you're connected to all of it. Therefore, love it unconditionally. Accept it as it is. So be attached to nothing, no outcome. And if you have it or don't have it, it, makes no difference. You'll have exactly what you need. And when you focus your life primarily on having what you need only and not worrying about the luxuries, the luxuries may come. But when you're no longer pursuing them, it matters not whether you have them or not. A fridge is just a fridge. But do you need a double door silver mirror fridge that talks seven different languages and cooks you breakfast while it sings Kumbaya. No, 
So why go and spend $100,000 on some poch and pool fridge? Why? Well, because my friends will be entertained. Well, we're no longer doing that. We just now keeps the food cold. That's all we need it for. Car just from A to B. You know, now it's no longer about look at me, look how fast it goes. It's just peaceful. Believing them to be the same, how can you tell them apart? Can you ask the part of your mind that taught you to believe they are the same, to teach you they are different? The mind doesn't even know that. It doesn't. It doesn't know what you're talking about. When you're reading this course, your ego just shuts off. Or if you've got a really strong ego that's learning this because you want to make yourself special, the ego is appropriating all of this. And how do you know the ego is appropriating this? Because it's questioning everything. Whereas the self, the holy self, when given to the guidance, it's it immediately the distinctions are clear. That's how I thought. This is how I now see it. That's how I saw the world. Thank you for this. The gratitude comes. If it's still questioning and finding fault and wanting to analyze, and does it say he or does it say she? And why is God? Ego's playing. Go quiet. Asked to be shown, asked to be led. Never start reading this course unless you acknowledge Christ's mind, unless you acknowledge the teacher, the great teacher, the Jesus that came before us, that is now the Christ, infused with God's Holy Spirit in us. Presence here now. Start. Be shown. Ask and you be shown. The Holy Spirit's teaching only takes one direction and only has one goal. His direction is freedom and his goal is God. Yet he cannot conceive of yet you and he cannot conceive of God without you because God is God because it is not God's will to be without you because God created you and resides in you. You are the kingdom. When you have learned that your will is God's, you could no more will to be without him than he could be will he could will to be without you. Why? Because he created you as a part of himself. This is the freedom. This is his joy. This is the joy. Deny yourself this and you're denying God his kingdom because you are God's kingdom. Because he created you for this. He created you as an extension of himself. The joyous extension of himself is what God does and still doing. And permanently always will. Eternally. And eternity is always present. It's not yet to there in time. When I say that all power and glory are yours because the kingdom is his, this is what I meant. The will of God without limit, powerfulness, the will of God is without limit. And all power and glory lie within the limitless power, which is God. It's boundless strength and love. Sorry, it's bound, it is boundless in strength and love and in peace. Therefore, you are boundless in strength and in love and in peace because this is the glory of God in his kingdom, which is you. 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 All of us. Unknowingly, but we're becoming knowingly this. It has no boundaries because it created all things. Try when you go present in silence. Find the boundary to that silence. You'll realize it just, there isn't. It extends forever. By creating all things, he made them part of itself. You are the will of God because that is how you were created. So you were created by the will of God and therefore you are the will of God. Because your creator created, creates only like himself. You are like him. Not in his image, but in his essence. That's a capital H and that's a you are part of him who is all power and glory and therefore as unlimited as he is. Okay. So you are the essence of God extending. You've just forgotten and you've dreamt and then you dreamt up this incredible universe. So it seems, but you've actually dreamt it out of fear and that fear became vengeance, fear, sin and guilt. To what else except all power and glory Draw straight leash. Can the Holy Spirit appear, appeal to the restore the kingdom? His appeal then is merely to what the kingdom is, which is you, and for its own acknowledgement of what it is. You are the kingdom, and, and the Holy Spirit's just asking you 
to acknowledge, just accept for one second the possibility of it and then allow it to be shown. Because when it shows it to you, you'll believe. It's not saying believe and I'll show you. It says, I'll show you as you believe it. And as you believe it, I'll show you. It's not saying, you know, preach what you believe. It says, believe what you preach. Let me say that again. It's not saying preach what you believe. It says, believe what you preach. And you will believe it even more because I'll give you the proof. When you acknowledge this, you bring the acknowledgement automatically to everyone. Why? Because everyone is you. They just seem to be separate. You one dreamer. Everyone is characters, activities in your mind, because you have acknowledged everyone as a part of you. By your recognition, you're awake there. By your recognition of what you are, be thyself knowing you. You awake them because there's no us. And through theirs, yours is extended because you're extending to your creations, all of us, we all are, in the same way God is continuously. Awakening runs easily and gladly through the kingdom. So this is what's happening to all of us right now, non-duality. In answer to the call from God that comes from within our temple, our heart, our, our kingdom of God. This is the natural response of every son of God to the voice of his creator. Because it is the voice for his creations. And his own extension. You, the extension, the love, the joy, the kingdom of God. Stop there for a second. Now on to text chapter 8, um, 8.3, the holy encounter. This is an incredibly powerful um, text which brings us into the, the preparation for realizing the holy instant. That moment, holy instant is the moment of moment of enlightenment, if I use those traditional words, but it really means the moment where the recognition of our shared being, of the self, the shared self, the shared holy son of God self, the dreamer, comes about and how it comes about. And it leads on from, from the previous chapter and it flows uh, because it just reinforces it in the, in the understanding of what you and God are, the very essence of it being shared. Glory to God in the highest and to you because he has willed it. Because God has willed you and therefore willed that you be gloried, glorified in the same way. Ask and it shall be given you because it already has been given, which means you already have it. So what you're really asking for is the removal of the blocks, the removal of the blocks that prevent the awareness of knowing you are that which God created as the kingdom and the extension of himself. Ask for the light, in other words, the clarity, and learn that you are light. So if you take symbols away, take the words away, peace, love, joy, kingdom of God, just imagine God as an infinite, ever-extending light. And one cell in that light went dark in its mind. It's still light, but it doesn't realize it is. So one cell, one sun fell asleep, dreamt the universe. So imagine the entire universe is happening in one cell of God. So as, as vast as we think the universe is in our little brains, in our little comprehension, this entire universe exists in the mind of one dreamer. And therefore, God is infinitely bigger than the universe times a gazillion times and still extending. And the reason the universe is still extending according to science is because as God extends, each one of the suns extends, but because this one sun, which is us, is dreaming that of separation and darkness and dreaming of the universe, our mind, which is the universe in matter, presented in matter, is still expanding too. If you want to understand, if you want understanding and enlightenment, the recognition of yourself is all that enlightenment is. You will learn it. You will recognize yourself because your decision to learn it is the decision to listen to the teacher, the Holy Spirit, who knows of light because he intermediates between God and, and the dreamer and can therefore teach it to you because he's made of light. He is the essence of light. 
The Holy Spirit is God's Spirit. There is no limit on your learning because there's no limit on your mind. Now, small mind means you're in the dreaming state. You as an individual activity in the dream is mind. The minute you capitalize the mind, you're back into divine mind, Christ mind, or God. There is no limit on his teachings because he was created to teach. Understanding his function perfectly, he fulfills it perfectly because that is his joy and yours. So you can take this as to referring to both Christ and Holy Spirit. And if you still see Christ as a representation or as Jesus as a representation of the awake mind, then ascribe that quality to the activity called Jesus, but recognize the activities in your mind too. So it's the part of your mind fully awake but part of your mind that brings about the awakening, the salvation of the, the end of the dream, in other words. To fulfill the will of God perfectly is the only joy and peace that can be fully known because it is the only function that can be fully experienced in true reality. And it filters through our illusion and perception and projection and everything becomes an echo. So the new world is the Holy Spirit reinterprets everything that was made in fear and anger and judgment of God in vengeance and reinterprets it as love. So everything becomes an echo for the voice for God and therefore for God. When this is, and this means people too, especially those that you've had conflict with, when you start to choose to see, when you choose to see them as, and, and know them as their shared being, not their outer body, not their behavior, not, not what they appear, not the relationship you have with them, brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, uncles, bosses, you realize the essence of that person is Christ. And I choose to honor the Christ in them and honor myself as that which honors the shared being. It's, the experience starts to change. Don't believe me. Put it to practice. See if it works. Okay. And it'll work and then give you more proof. And then they'll ask you to do it again, because the more you do it, the more peaceful you are, the more joyous you are, the less judgment, the less conflict that happens between the two of you whether it's you and your mother that fought since you were nine years old, and all of a sudden your mother starts loving you and being kind and your relationships start working. Why? Because you're recognizing the essence in her as a truth and the outer embodiment, just a reflection of the forgetfulness. But as you recognize the truth, the outer embodiment starts representing the truth. And hence the relationship seems to be healed. What Jesus said, where two of you are gathered in my name, there I shall be also in what? In spirit as the essence of the relationship, as the essence of the shared being of the two of you. In actual fact, Christ is the two of us fully awake. And while we're dreaming, thinking there's two of us, the truth of us is still Christ, son of God. When this is accomplished, then there is no other experience because it's all you'll ever know and all you'll ever want. And you're given nothing up and things are just things and you're still having your luxuries and your houses and your cars and your friends and relationships and children and husband and wives. But the experience, the knowing of it, things just become more peaceful. Why? Because you're no longer judging. And since you're no longer judging, it's no longer attacking you because judgment is an attack thought. Yet the wish for other experiences will block this accomplishment because God's will cannot be forced upon you, being an experience of total willingness. Hence, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Know thyself. Be thyself knowing. The Holy Spirit understands how to teach this, but you do not. And therefore, before you teach, make sure there's an alignment between you and your ultimate truth, the Holy Spirit, the memory of God. That is why you need him and why God gave him to you. Only his teaching will release you, your will to God's, uniting it with his power and glory and establishing them as yours. God's power and glory is yours. Thy will be done. The power and glory are yours forever now. Lord's prayer. You share them as God shares them because it's the natural outcome of their being, their shared being. Remember, there's only one being, and that's the shared being of God. There's not billions of beings. In the dream, there's billions of spirit beings, fractures of the one being the sun, which is the one being shared with God. It's not God and the sun. It's a joining. There's no separation. There's no divide. It's a continuation of extension of the love, which is God, of the light, which is God. The will of the Father and of the Son are one. 
by their extension, what I've just said, they're continually extending the love they are. Their extension is the result of their oneness, holding their unity together by extending their joint will. I will to will thy will, because your will is all there is, my father. This is a perfect, this is perfect creation by the perfectly created you in union with the perfect creator, God. The father must give fatherhood to his son because his own fatherhood must be extended outward, extended. You can full stop there. Outward is because there's no out and in. It's just a continuous extension. You who belong to God and in God have the holy function of extending his fatherhood by placing no limits upon that you which is limitless. Let the Holy Spirit teach you how to do this. Love your creations. Forgive, forgive, forgive until you're at peace. And then love your creations, which means be yourself knowingly, passionately, through your talent, serve. Consciously aware of being aware, recognizing Christ in everyone you see, realizing you're the dreamer, you've dreamt all of this up, and you're awakening in God. That's it. That's what the Holy Spirit's teaching. For you can know what it means only of God himself. When you meet anyone, remember, it is a holy encounter, not someone special, blah, blah, blah. Everyone, remember, it is a holy encounter because it's you meeting your holy self, you, your holy self meeting your holy self in the recognition of love, the love you are. That's why I say you can't love someone. You can't even love yourself. You recognize yourself as love and you recognize each other as love. And you extend the love you are with self and all. As you see him, you will see yourself. As you treat him, you will treat yourself. And you can't treat other people well and treat yourself badly. And people that treat themselves badly and think of themselves badly attack other people. It's a fact. You, your relationship with the world is your relationship with yourself. You can pretend to be all holy on the outside. You're beating yourself up. You're actually attacking the world even though you're pretending to be holy. And that's why so many spiritual people get so angry and enraged when you challenge their belief systems because they, they want to be adorned. They want to be appeased. They want to be recognized. They want to be seen as special, magical, spiritual, magical witches and, and source errors. As you think of him, you will think of yourself. Never forget this because you're identical. It's you. You're dreaming all those characters up. Never forget this. For in him you will find or lose yourself in your brother. And so when you judge a brother, you know, remember, as you find yourself judging, say, holy, my holy brother, give me your blessing, and I give you my blessing. Whenever two sons of God meet, and now the sons, are, we're talking about the characters in the dream, now, because God's sons in heaven, in the kingdom, there's no need to meet because they're an extension of themselves, Okay. So in the dream, the sons are the fractures of the sun. Whenever two sons meet, they are given another chance at salvation. That's why if you haven't forgiven, you repeat the lesson, another chance. So you one failed relationship, attack, 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 defend, attack, attack. You break up, bugger this person, don't love anymore, go. Next one. If you haven't forgiven that, if you haven't recognized the lesson is in you, your next relationship, as charming, as romantic as it may seem in the first three months, six months, one year, whatever the romantic period is, will come back to the same lesson in a completely different way. So the first guy was super poor um, and uh, he beat himself up and then he attacked you. And the second guy was super rich, but he beat you up and then beat himself. What's changed? You're still outside yourself, attacking yourself from within. It's, so whether he has money, no money, rich, no rich, handsome, not handsome, the same lesson is being repeated. This one um, this one cheated on you with an other woman. This one cheats on you because he doesn't give you any time and he spends all the time at the office. So you're still lonely. You're in a relationship. That one's cheating with women. This one's cheating with work. So what is it? You don't give yourself time. You don't give yourself acknowledgement. So that other person doesn't give you time and acknowledgement. You think that one was worse because that one cheated. This one's better but because he makes money. He gives you all the gifts, but he still doesn't give you time. Same lesson, you find yourself alone because you don't believe you're worthy. You don't believe you, you deserve God's love. You are God's love. And so you're looking for love from something else outside you. And you'll never find it because you can't find love. You recognize your love. And when you recognize your love, 
you'll recognize their love, and that relationship will be very different. If you've forgiven the previous ones, if not that lesson, that new relationship, and he could be fully conscious Christ-like, and you're going to have a problem. So everybody, every time someone comes to him and he's laying hands and, and healing people or praying with them or turning water into wine, you're going to be all jealous because he's not giving you attention. Because you haven't healed, you're still insecure, you're going to demand more of his time, and you're going to want all of his time because you're not healed. So recognize that every relationship is a holy encounter and another opportunity for salvation. What is salvation? Atonement. What is atonement? Recognition of the self. Enlightenment. Same thing. Do not leave anyone, and I'm not talking verbally, but in the recognition, anyone without giving salvation to him and receiving it for yourself, because to give means you have it. For I am always there with you in remembrance of you. The goal of the curriculum, regardless of the teacher you choose, is know thyself. Now, you heard me say that. A million times and now you know why i'm saying it because this is so important the goal of the curriculum the course in miracles regardless of the teacher you choose and i'm surprised that more teachers don't do this not a criticism there it is know thyself be thyself knowingly with total certainty there is nothing else to seek you can't find happiness freedom move country move jobs change this change the color of your hair Etc. Etc. Try and identify as a squid, a lesbian squid that comes from Mars, and you're not happy. Know thyself. You're not this body mind. You're not your identity. You're the essence, which is the shared essence, the shared being with everyone and God. Everyone is looking for himself, herself, for the power and the glory he thinks he has lost or is owed to them, the sense of entitlement, which is not incorrect if it's the self-awareness entitlement, because you're entitled to know yourself, but not you're not entitled to anything in the illusion, because the last thing you're entitled to is an illusion. Whenever you are with anyone, you have another opportunity to find them and yourself as a shared being. Your power and glory are in him because they are yours, and that's why we're given each other and the people that go and hide and become reclusives because they're empaths and they want to hide from the world, they miss out on the opportunity of seeing the mirrors and loving themselves, loving their creation. The ego tries to find them in yourself. Okay. And that's why the ego, knowing that you get waking up, says, go and find a little hut in the middle of nowhere and live by yourself and avoid the world. And I've seen so many people like that in their last days of life. They get attacked in their homes, they get brutalized, eaten by leopards. We have leopards in South Africa. So why? Because they're still having attack thoughts about themselves. They're now hidden from the world, alone and, you know, off the grid. You're never off the grid. You are the grid. Okay? And so only the powerless experience no power in electricity. The ego tries to find them in yourself alone because it does not know where to look. And so it tries to educate itself and make itself special and then try to convince everybody else that it is. And woe be to you if people believe it because then you believe your own shit and then you get trapped in your own special spiritual powers, okay? The Holy Spirit teaches you that if you look only at yourself, you cannot find yourself. Why? Because who's looking and who's searching? Because that is not what you are and you cannot find that which doesn't exist. Whenever you are with a brother, you are learning what you are because both of you are teaching what you are, what you are and you're teaching all the time. And it's an opportunity to extend the love you are and therefore share the teaching of the love you are with each other. He will respond either with pain or with joy, depending on which teacher you are following. He will respond either with pain or joy, depending on which teacher you are following. Why? Why will he respond on pain and joy based on what you teach him? Because you're mirrors of each other. He will be imprisoned or released according to your decision, and so will you, because why? is a reflection of your decision. So whenever a relationship comes in your way, they're all holy encounters to show you. Um, sorry that I'm scratching so much. I've got cat hair all over me at the moment. So kitty cat was just sitting here, and uh, he just sh shook himself. I've got hair all over me now. So he will be imprisoned or released according to your decision, and so will you. So I'm responsible for the cat hair. <laughs> Never forget your responsibility to him. Because it's your responsibility to yourself, since there's only one self in both of you. Give him his place in the kingdom, 
and you will have yours because then you'll realize it is yours. The kingdom cannot be found alone. And you who are the kingdom cannot find yourself alone. To achieve the goal of the curriculum, then you cannot listen to the ego whose purpose is to defeat its own goal and therefore keep you bound by people, places, things, and events or avoidance of all of it. So detach or attach, whereas the answer is non-attachment. Realize you're connected to all of it. The ego does not know this because it does not know anything, but you can know it and you will know it because it's already in you. If you are willing to look at what the ego would make of you, this is your responsibility, not mine, yours, as mine is for me. Because once you have really looked at you, you will accept the atonement for yourself. And that's how you heal the world. You don't heal it by trying to fix the world. What other choice could you make? You've tried everything else. Having made this choice, you will understand why you once believed that when you met someone else, you thought he was someone else or she was someone else. Either trying to take something from you or give something to you. And if they gave something to you, you then feared losing it. And then you became the attached needy one. And so every holy encounter in which you enter fully will teach you this is not so. So give every relationship to God. You can encounter only part of yourself because you are part of God, who is everything. And therefore, everything shows you reflections of yourself. His power and, glo His power and glory are everywhere. And you cannot be excluded from them. The ego teaches you that your strength is in you alone. And so you try and build your defenses and equip yourself with skills so that you can be better, special, better equipped, more special, et cetera, et cetera. The Holy Spirit teaches that all strength is in God and therefore in you. And therefore you can do anything if you allow it to happen through you as the instrument and your body becomes simply an instrument for God's work. God wills no one suffer. He does not will anyone suffer for a wrong decision, including you, no matter what you think you've done in your dream, you've done nothing. This is why he gives you the means for undoing it. And the means is the memory of him and yourself in him. And that's called the Holy Spirit. Through his power and glory, all your wrong decisions are undone completely, releasing you and your brother from every imprisoning thought of any part of the sonship holds. Wrong decisions have no power, just a dream because they are not true and therefore they'll never be true and they have no power. The imprisonment they seem to produce is no more true than they are. The power and the glory belong to God alone. You belong to God alone. So the power and glory, since they belong to God, belong to you. God gives whatever belongs to him because he gives of himself And everything belongs to him, including you. And therefore, the shared being is shared equally amongst all. Giving, your, giving of yourself is the function he gave you. Why? Because it's the function he gives you by giving of himself. Fulfilling it perfectly will let you remember what you, what you have of him. And by this, you will remember also what you are in him. You are the love and joy of God. You cannot be powerless to do this because this is your power. Remember this and be willing to recognize it as true. God's glory, glory is God's gift to you. Glory is not God, our gift to God, which, which is how we've mistakenly seen it. Let's give glory unto God. No, you are the glory of God. Share that with your brothers. Because that is what he is. See this glory everywhere and remember what you are. Everything is an echo for the voice for God when you're willing to see Christ in everything. We'll stop there and then we'll continue with lesson. Next week we'll do um, four, five, and six. And then, so this Sunday we'll do four, five, and six. And next week, Wednesday, we'll do uh, seven, eight, and nine. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for joining. I hope this has shone some clarity and given you some light on, on the non-duality of the reality that you and God are one and that you are the love, the glory, the kingdom 
of God. You are the mind which is awake. You are the mind which is the Christ. You are an activity localized, no different to Jesus. Jesus woke up demonstrating that you too can as a localization of the same mind. Since his mind awoke and since he, since he, he was crucified, resurrected and ascended, you no longer need to. You can move straight into ascension through the recognition of yourself, shared being with Christ, shared being with all, shared being with God. Go in peace. Have a wonderful week. And I'll speak to you soon. See you next. See you on Sunday.